Um, let's continue. This is where we stopped last time, or maybe we just did a bit of this as well last time. I'm going to sort this out. Um, consequences for diagnostics when you have uh, misspecified your variables or the model as a whole. What were the consequences? Well, we said bias and consistency, oh, sorry, the bias and efficiency would be uh, affected. Do you remember what the bias would mean? For what for coefficient? Yeah, if the coefficient is bias, what do we mean uh, so in practice? Yes, it's not right on the true value, right? So the uh, the the mean of the sampling distribution of beta hats will be uh, somewhere uh, yeah. off the mark or off the uh, true value. Population. Yes, and population. Can we, can we say that that is very often connected with an increase of the variance as well? Um, not necessarily, because that variance is uh, estimated independent of the coefficient estimation. Um, variance increase means inefficiency. That's inefficient, and the other is bias. Uh, yes, the other inefficiency means the sampling distribution of sample beta ones will be wider. It will be inefficient. The variance will be inef uh, higher. The so standard deviation would be higher, in other words. Um, then what is uh, consistency? Okay, maybe I should I should draw this in a bit because that that probably helps you, and it's also something in the exam as I expect it to be in the exam as well. So let's let's just continue. This wasn't in yeah. Inefficiency? No, no not the that. not the topic. But I'm gonna. Uh, you see, the reason I am going to show you what I'm doing, drawing now is because I repeat the words efficiency bias and consistency oh, and that's what I'm trying to explain what they are if we don't know it hmm? we've done it, right? yes we've done it in the second lecture I think or third uh, if we don't know what they are obviously what I'm talking now will not make sense or what I've been talking so far will not make sense you remember the, yes we should go now I realize that uh, could have done earlier uh, so why is my screen not coping so let's try Now, here is our uh, model. This is our true model. If we estimate it with a bias, let me put this first. This is our uh, distribution of beta 1 hats. And right in the middle of it is our beta 1, which is the population, population, beta 1, which is expected to be cool, our estimate is expected to equal to this. Now, if the estimate is unbiased, this would be the case. Our estimated beta 1 would be equal to or around this value. But, Oh, well, let me let me turn. Let me put the term blue. This is our blue distribution. This is where the estimate estimator in this case blue best linear unbiased estimator. That's the linear equation. Now, if unbiasedness doesn't hold, it means our estimated beta's will have distributions like this, and we end up estimating this something like this which is far off, away from this value. So that's unbiased. That's a biased estimate. So this is biased. Biased. Biased estimate. Make sense to you guys? So I am, <coughs> I am getting beta 1, which had, which is different from beta 1 through population. So that's why we were getting this uh, larger or smaller values than what, it is, uh, what they could be in the complete regression model. That's a bias, idea of bias. Or maybe next time I take a sample and this time I get this distribution. And again, the beta one using this distribution hat is, is different from the one that we wanted to see. So that's bias. Now, inefficiency means basically 
my estimator will have this sort of distribution, sampling distribution. What's this? You see? This is huge variance. Yeah, this. Okay, this is not helping. So I'm going to draw it again. This is our unbiased and efficient one. This is blue. But this one here is inefficient. It's it's estimating the beta one hat properly. It's unbiased, but it will have variance twice as much as the uh, unbiased one, an efficient one. So that's inefficiency. This means you may get large standard errors, which means again the t values will be lower. How about inconsistency? So wait, this one was what? Inefficient. Inefficient. inefficient estimator. Usually we call it estimator because the, the sample causes our estimator to give out estimates which are not what we expect. Now, next is... Um, are you still copying? No, no. no? Okay. <coughs> Next is inconsistency or consistency of estimators. Now, this again is our blue. Estimate here, that's given. We hit the right or the true value. But if it's inconsistent, inconsistent is a, uh, is a, a sample specific term again. Say that we initially uh, sampled thousand variable observations and estimated and we get this this is the estimate we get from first sample then do second sample and we got this many observations and we estimated <coughs> what happens is that the true value is is now this uh, sorry estimated value is this then we increase sample to uh, 3000 Remember, the larger the sample size, more accurate the value is, the more closer to the uh, true value. Uh, then we get this. We are approaching. So this is based on N1, this is based on N2, and this is based on N3. Now we do N4. So we increase the sample to 5,000, and we are almost, almost there. So my, my bias is almost getting away. So this last one is quite close to my true beta here. This last one is, is, is has a mean which is very close to the true value. This is consistent estimating, or estimator, I should say. As we increase sample size, our betas are getting better and better, much more true than the, uh, the, the before. But something called inconsistency might appear here. When the uh, estimator is not consistent, no matter how many samples you have in your, or no matter how many observations you have in your sample, the distribution doesn't come close to the true distribution. So it, 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 is, it, is, it will probably be somewhere around here. It, it keeps going around here. It won't approach the true one. But well, how do you know that it's not approaching the true one? We will not know it without uh, real getting the correct specification. If you omit the variable... Is there, is there a reason to like gauge it in the sense that you, for example, might add observations? Yes, and yes. It's moving, like it's not yes, exactly. moving towards a certain point, but yes, just we can. moving around. We so can assess it, yes. Using and that's something where we can say there's likely to be consistency. Yes. It's called durban Hosman uh, consistency test, I think. Okay. And I will I will do that. Uh, so the consistency basically or inconsistency basically means you need a larger sample size. Even if you, you know, inconsistent means even if you increase the sample size, it won't have a true value. Your all estimates will not be true. Consistency means as you increase the sizes, you will have more and more closer value to the true value. Yeah. So the other way around would be if you have even if you increase the sample, mm -hmm. it will still be inconsistent if the estimate is inconsistent. Mm. You will still have non-true values. Inconsistency means no matter how large your sample is, 
you will still have inconsistent estimates. But what does inconsistent estimates mean? It means basically no matter how much you, how many, how many observations you add, you still get biased estimates. It means that or, the sample doesn't behave in the way it should. Be. No sample behave. It's just what you're sampling is is basically contains mismeasured oh, okay. values. Okay. So it keeps giving you wrong results. That's mm -hmm. inconsistency. Consistency means Isn't as it? you increase your sample, you get. Do more? we know for sure that it's like mis like a mismeasurement, or is it? Could it be that how we evaluate or interpret like that our model how our model interprets the observations is just wrong? It could be caused by many factors, but okay. main one that we're looking at today in the new lecture is the one that's mismeasurement, okay. which we can control. Okay, in the sense that like the actual data is inconsistent. Exactly, actual data is not consistent with the true observations. Okay. That gives you inconsistent estimate. Yeah. Because of mismeasurement. Yeah. Say that I will now ask you, I'll give you a survey, for example, today, and ask you to put down your uh, family income, annual income. How much do you know about your family income, for example? Very little, right? So you just give me an approximate result. So that approximation of your family income will go into my regression and causes my estimators to be inconsistent no matter how many more students I survey. Make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this mismeasurement error is creating an inconsistent uh, or inducing inconsistent estimates. Now, let's stop here and think. Is, in, is, the, is, is the inconsistent one probably is confusing? Is this clear to you guys? Estimate again. So if there's no mismeasurement, yeah. that means the higher the sample size, the better the your estimates estimate. will be. Yes, it will. They will be closer, closer to the so this true is value. The graph shows basically. Yeah, okay. in graphical depth. However, however, if there's a mismeasurement error, Sebastian, if there's a mismeasurement error, mm -hmm. your estimate oh, your, your estimates won't. Yes, it won't come to, be yes, exactly. They will still be around this region. It won't yeah. come, they won't come close to the main bar, the true bar. Basically, they get closer, closer, but they, they may get closer, closer to the main sample, uh, a true value, but they won't be close enough to give us the true value, basically. Because sample size induces a bit better information, but you still have mismeasured incomes that gives us uh, inconsistent results. Yeah, it makes sense, guys. Because the sample contains these errors in your in my observations. Because your income may be hundred thousand, you give me ninety eight thousand. So two thousand pound is an error. Someone gives you ninety seven. Someone's income is seventy thousand. They give me sixty thousand. So ten thousand. So errors eventually in the observations lead to errors in my estimations. For example, inflation is measured with the errors, right? True inflation may be 5% in the UK, but because of our adopted CPI inflation mm -hmm. formula, it gives us 9%. So we have that error in our yeah. observation. Maybe next year, by chance, we get the true value. Following year, again, true value, but then the following year, later, we get the wrong values. Yeah? Now, in con this mismeasurements are not a problem with time series, like inflation. In cross-section, it does make. Cross-sectional data usually are based on surveys, and people do not usually give us knowingly or unknowingly, so intentionally or not intentionally, give us incorrect values. And these will feed into your model, give us the wrong betas. Now, how do we know these are wrong? By, well, by we, take, we do the test. Durbin and Hausman Durbin test or Durbin Hausman test of consistency. So we'll see if there is a bias or not coming out of this inconsistency in our estimations. Right, if that's correct, oh, sorry, that, if that's uh, clear to you, uh, we'll go back to the. Uh, so this is from last week. We did part of it, and we continue now. Okay, let's start this now. All right, okay, I'm getting it now. 
need to move forward now. These are things that we covered early, so you have to be patient with me now. It's not moving as fast as I want it to. And it doesn't start from the point that you, you want it to start, from the PowerPoint slides. It just starts from the beginning. Right? Here it is, finally. Consequence of, consequences of, uh, let me go back. Is it? Okay, that's the one. Consequence of uh, misspecifications to, uh, for diagnostics. Here is the regression from last week. I think we discussed this. Height was included, remember? So learnings, log learnings, uh, log earnings usually, or the person's earnings, salaries, depend on what they're schooling and their experience usually. Now, we just added an irrelevant variable, height. And it appears to be a significant highly. Mm -hmm. We usually said <coughs> when you add an <coughs> irrelevant variable, what was the uh, usual effect? What was the usual effect? What would be the usual effect, I should say, if you had if you had an irrelevant variable? But it's not significant. It should be insignificant and also should induce higher efficiency, uh, sorry, higher variance on the main variables like S and expected value. Experience in so this case. So higher standard error. Hmm? High standard yeah. error, uh, standard errors, yeah? That would be if inefficient uh, estimation. Now, in this case, however, interesting, height is actually significant, not it's not insignificant, it's significant. It has a low standard error itself. It's possibly due to some other variable that's being correlated with this one. It's mimicking the effect of that variable that we didn't include. Sometimes that might happen. So we might theoretically expect that adding irrelevant variable only affects the inefficiency. But in this case, it's actually giving us the wrong impression that Height has a significant effect on our earnings. So if we were taller, we could earn more, in other words. That's the economic interpretation of this result. So tall people will earn more than the shorter people, is according that to... Because it includes the effect of gender? Which exactly. Case. It's probably correlated with gender or maybe some other variables. So let's have a look. What we do now is we just include the gender now. And male basically stands for gender. Male, this male variable added here just below height is basically a, a, what you call this? Gender variable dummy. If a person is male, the variable takes one, otherwise it's zero. Now, originally we had two effects here. One is that irrelevant variable was added. Second, that we had omitted variable. Now that omitted variable is added, this becomes insignificant and this is now irrelevant. Because male is included, this becomes irrelevant now. Yeah. But isn't it if they have such a high correlation that before height was significant, then it might be also likely that if you still have both um, variables, so height and male, that they're both not significant? Not both. Usually at least one of them. So both of them could possibly. But at least you one of them will have a high, uh, high standard error. Oh. So in this case, height become uh, insignificant because its standard error now increased. At least one of them. You'll, this is a good question, actually. In the next one, uh, in the next slide, which is the proxy variable slide, you will see that uh, one of them will have a high standard error, making it uh, not significant in the end. 
Right, so now we, we remove the omitted variable bias, but then we still have irrelevant variable bias. It, not bias, but effect in this case, because the standard errors of S, expect experience and male are still higher, although they are already significant that increase stand, standard error, uh, increase uh, efficient, inefficiency of standard error is not, uh, is not uh, inducing it or causing the insignificance in the variables. So, makes sense, guys? So, consequences are, are there, especially for omitted variables. We end up uh, interpreting correctly. Now, proxy variables. We use proxy variables quite often in macroeconomics because probably we don't have exact variable itself. Say that we're doing a in your assignment mm -hmm. trade variable. Or distance. Distance is is one proxy plus. Uh, Based exactly, political stability, we don't have any measure other than some indicators uh, estimated by World Bank. Mm -hmm. We don't have a direct valuation of political stability. They estimate it, taking into account various factors. Um, so we then proxy for the actual variable instead of trying to find the actual variable. Maybe over time we will come up with a more in intelligent way of uh, estimating the, or coming up with the actual variables. Now, so assume that the true variable is the, uh, true model is at the top, but we don't have an X2. Instead, we proxy it with, uh, with that expression, lambda plus mu z. So z is our proxy, but it's not a direct proxy x2 is not exactly equal to z, it's measured with some impre imprecision, so lambda is basically inducing some sort of bias, mu is also. And plug that into x2 and, and in the end what we have is this, uh, where is my cursor? Okay, you don't see my cursor, right? Okay, I'll have to stand now. So we will then estimate instead of that two model, this model. What's what's changing here? Theta 1, which is our true model's coefficient uh, for intercept, is now absorbing this part, which doesn't have, which is the which is product of the two variables here, coefficient estimates. So that will be our theta 1. We are not worried about the theta 1. It will still be acceptable. However, theta 2 will now be the product of mu and theta 2. Effect of X2 is now the beta 2 times mu. Now moving forward, we have all this remaining the same, so including the proxy variable doesn't affect our estimation of the beta 3, beta 4, beta 5, beta k, whatever the betas are, are the variable estimates. Standard errors will be the same for them. R squared will be the same because proxy is still valid, although it's imprecise. However, we don't get the exact beta 2 here, as in here, because beta 2 is now this 2 together, the product. So beta 2 is the product. So, and we don't know mu as well, so it comes out of the estimation. Now, T statistic for Z will probably be the same for X2. It doesn't affect the efficiency. <coughs> well, intercept is not, as I said earlier, the same again. But we are not worried about the intercept. We are not concerned, I should say, about the intercept anyway. It's a reason that in economics we don't usually uh, use it. However, it only works with approximations, by the way. So we only have approximate. Proxy, as such, our results are approximate results. If the proxy is irrelevant, then obviously we still have the omitted variable bias, because x2 will still be in the u, which then correlates with the z, oh sorry, with the x's here, which then binds their coefficient estimates. Go ahead. If you notice a big change in your intercept, do that mean that you have the proxy variable? Um, could be for many reasons, but obviously, if 
if you add a variable and it changes affects the beta too, it could be not necessarily to the proxy variable, but could also be proxy variable. Because as you add more variables, what changes is the R squared changes and the intercept changes. Mm -hmm. So very hard to know what it is. But usually, whether you add a proxy owner or the exact X, the beta one will change at each iteration. Does it make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. So the beta one's change is not necessarily only due to the proxy one, but even if the correct variable is included, beta one has to change. Because if it's not included, beta one was 10, let's say, because it was in the U, the variable was in the U. As long as you take the X2, as soon as you take the X2 from U and put it into the main model, then beta one gives its absorbed effect to beta two. So each, each one accounts for their own effect and beta one will change. Or we can proxy it and we can get the same result. So beta one, I, I, don't, I haven't heard about any, uh, any tests for beta one because we don't, we aren't concerned with beta one at all. It's, it's something that we don't look at really. It's included such that it helps us to get unbiased instance in the rest of the coefficients. It's, it has to be included so that its estimation is also consistent and unbiased. So, is an example. Here is an example of a uh, proxy variable. Remember, we, we talked about schooling earlier. Schooling, the number of years a person is in education or has an education, could be secondary, tertiary, universities, mm -hmm. is due to their cognitive ability, how able they are to learn, plus family background. Mother's education and father's education. We said that both of them have an effect. If educated people have children, their children are more likely to be educated. If a child is born in a family, parents are not educated, they work in lab laborious jobs or factories, and then they more likely will carry on you know, the tradition of not being, not being educated. So family background does affect the schooling of the child, of the individual. But how do you measure the family background? There are various measurement methods, but one, one that we can take into account, or what can, we can measure or observe, is mother's education, mother's schooling, and father's schooling. Instead of including just one, you could include both of them and create a variable called index for that. So index of family background. Then obviously index will not be, you know, this together will not be direct proxy to it. It would have some other mismeasurement in the uh, in the proxy. So some other inefficiencies or uh, impreci imprecision. So SF basic index is a function of SM and SF with some sort of added values. <laughs> As if I'm singing a lullaby. <laughs> You're actually <laughs> sleeping. And I'm listening. Oh, okay, you are. So plug that into this. Ah, let's go back. And you have this instead of that true population model, we will have estimated this. We would have estimated this. So our beta one is now proxied by this. Beta two is proxied by that. It's not affected, but beta three is proxied by now these but two together. Okay. Yeah. It's because of this that we can't really talk much about the intercept. Because um, it's not really. Could possibly, but but then let's do this. Assume that a family has a child <coughs> whose cognitive ability is zero. Family background, schooling is zero, so uneducated people. Then that beta two would just be the schooling of the. Oh, sorry, this intercept would then be schooling. <coughs> yeah, but if you have multiple proxies and like a regression, it doesn't really. Then, yeah, it gets a bit messy here. Yeah, you can think of it that way as well. Um, however, there are models where intercept makes sense you still have to look at its significance. 
There are models on, we are only concerned with only one data. And everything else is just a control variable to see what happens to data to we add, just like we're doing. Our main focus is on distance and GDP's coefficient estimate. Right? We want to see if these two are made have carry carry the main effect. And we add other variables, proxies, and ignoring the we're ignoring the intercept again, remember? Focus is on the two. So this is our GDP times theta two, and this is our trade times two. We add many more. Obviously, our intercept changes, but we ignore it because we're focusing on this. Because what 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 was our hypothesis? The hypothesis was that if these two are significant, or what are the significant determinants of trade between countries? And our fact, we're focusing on these two by adding more 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 of these to see if we had omitted anything else. Yeah. So we ignore that, and in this process, we are determining of if any of these added variables are significant. If they are, we just flag it and then mention in our assessment that in addition to the two, we have significant effects from the others. Do you have any question? You started smiling, so I thought maybe you have a question. <laughs> what happened? Is it so boring? No, we're just having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> because I see one or two of you sleeping. No, I just close my eyes. <laughs> I hope you're not wasting your time. Okay, so let's go ahead and estimate this. Not what happened. If we just ignore family background, we would estimate this model with 1.58 as the coefficient estimate. But as soon as we entered enter this into the SM and SF into the main model, estimated main model, what we have is this a small coefficient estimate. So there is some sort of omitted variable bias, right? If we omit this two, we would have higher value. So there's a positive bias of the two omitted variables because these two correlate with the uh, ABC. There's a, a little bit of multiple linearity between them. If they were not correlating, then 1.858 will have appeared here. But because, remember the formula I told you? We still doing the first thing. So yeah, there's a, there is this effect of omitted variables beta times the covariance between the two variables. So if you look at the bias, you first look at the correlation um, between the two variables, or do you look at the what? Um, mm -hmm. Or do you look at the fact that, for example, ASV, ABC has on Y? What you do is, uh, you see the strategy here. You start with single regression, Y on X, and record the coefficient estimate, say 1.58. Then you add the next coefficient uh, variable, and you check the main one again. If it's changing, then look at the correlation. Okay. If it's positive, that is the reason why it's positive, or we changing. So there is an omitted variable bias. You can you can mention it, or we just ignore it. Mm -hmm. But what what I told you to do is is start with simple, add more and more to see what happens to the main variable. As soon as it gets a huge difference from previous regressions, from the first few regressions, then there's certainly an omitted variable bias, and you can talk about correlation at that point. Mm -hmm. And keep adding. Here is a huge difference. 1.5 age is not a small amount compared to this when we have the original one. Okay, so that's that. Next. I will notice that when we add these two variables as proxy, multicollinearity kicks in. We talked about it in the that when you add the Proxy variable and it's it is causing multiple linearity, then both variables have to be not significant. But in fact, at least one of them will be not significant, and in this case, this is SM. <coughs> so, because this there is a correlation between them, it's like educated mother looking for educated father. You know, they it's possible that educated girls to the educated boys or boys to the educated girls, or usually romance is in the workplace or somewhere where. They, you meet, happen to be together for a long time. So, there's always the case of correlation between uh, girls' education with the 
boys education. So you don't see a family where the uh, uh, one of the adults is parents is basically working for an investment bank, the other one is just working in a factory. You don't see that, right? It's rarely that the factory one is uneducated, assuming that the investment bank is educated. So it's very rare case. So you will see that both of them either working in a bank or one is in office working, one is just doing something. So there's some sort of education. So there's a positive correlation between them. Because we include them together, this together in a model, and they correlate. It's in the next slide. Yeah. And they correlate. SM and SF correlate. The weaker one gets beaten. Looks like my wrong analogy here. <laughs> you know, I'm expect, I expected fathers to get the beating, but it's the mothers who are getting it. So this coefficient now is on the borderline in terms of significance. That was a wrong, wrong analogy. Sorry, guys. <laughs> So wrong analogy, but I hope it woke you up. Um, what do we do next? So these are multicollinearity. What did he say in the in the lecture last time? If there's a multicollinearity between two variables, we drop one. one. We have to drop one of them. Um, as long as dropping doesn't misspecify our whole regression. So should we drop SM or SF? Because if we drop SM, this will still be significant, but if we drop SF, this will be significant. Should drop SM. Okay, you, you say it's SM, but this, that's correct probably, because this is the only one that has a weak effect, so we can drop it naturally. But we have to also be careful with it, if it involves theory, if it's not something that we added, we are doing with the trade model, we're just adding whatever relevant, but not necessarily theoretically correct. But if it's by theory, if your model is based on or grounded on, let's say this is grounded, that's in not funky words, grounded on the theory, then you shouldn't drop. You should find ways of transformation such that both of them are still retained, but we don't have multicollinearity. So basically, for example, our sum is if we exclude distance or because that part of the... It's a theory, you cannot exclude them, yes. it's. Basically, you can say that trade doesn't have significant effect on my on the trade. Uh, so distance doesn't have significant effect on the trade, but then that's because of my sample. Yeah, you should still include it because GDP will then get this effect, huge effect, then because of positive. Or then we'll have this downward bias because trade uh, distance has a negative effect. Yeah. So what we can do is we can tell that this is probably because of my sample. Or the year, because we have chosen a recent year. But wouldn't, wouldn't the, uh, wouldn't the bias also depend on the correlation between distance and GDP? Yes. But then I don't know how we can correlate the distance. How we can GDP. think of GDP depending on distance? Well, it depends on the country you choose. For example, in a European country, distance is probably negatively related to GDP size. So what I'm so what saying countries. is, if you are if you if your neighbor is rich, you get rich. No, no. In Europe, where most no, countries are fairly wealthy, it's just it's, it's, if you're in Africa, you have a lot of poor countries. And then you can put it far away. And the further you are away, the richer countries get. Which means yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Yes. So possibly then. Yeah, that makes sense. So long as um, is it direct. But then if you're like in Asia, then yeah, that's the thing. Europe, for example, Spain. Yeah. Well, let's assume that there's a positive correlation, line. possibly. But uh, even distance may make because before the distance uh, was made because of both the proxy for like um, how far away, but now it's like with technology and yeah. like Yeah, could possibly be, then you can argue that way as well, yes. That's what I'm trying to say because of the timing. But again, again, whatever you think, it's economics. As long as you can justify it, yeah. your point, that's fine, it's acceptable and, and I think you, you get a, a good uh, sort of uh, reception for your argumentation. Now, um, I think today political ideology is more important than distance these days, isn't it? Think of this North Korea. China is a huge country with so much richness and Saudi, so it's, it's between the two developing 
powers. You know, South Korea is much more developed, obviously. But North Korea is still is next to Japan, even in developed economy. Yeah? The distance here is the close. So here it's the political ideology. Yeah? Yeah, but isn't that maybe kind of like an extreme outlier? Which one? South Korea? Yeah. North Korea. Same with Iran. Like these, right. are, yes. these are outliers. You can think of it that way. It's the, it's, well, outliers due to for, uh, for a reason, isn't it? Due yeah. to sanctions. Because it's like due to extreme like, political situations. Exactly. So that, that's that, the political that also, ideology. But that, that also excludes them from other things, for example, participation in the World Trade Organization or access to like, foreign investment. This is political ideology, yeah. So like or like the political ideology has a wide reaching effect on like the other institutional factors where the exactly. massive impact on trade is coming mm -hmm. from. It's not only like the trade political. distance, yeah. So in that case the main effect will become this distance becomes irrelevant, right? Yeah. So in this case. Yeah. While in the other cases when you are close to rich people, you are richer, but North Korea case is it's exclusion. Yeah. It becomes an outlier. But you still have to take into account because it still trades it's to an extent with country. its neighbors. Because of ideology, it, ideology is that neighbors, other countries' goods are inferior than ours. Mm. They are fed wrong, wrong information, basically. But well, then even with North Korea, isn't it true? Because like, we have to look at their trade balance, and they do only trade with their neighbors. China, yeah. Not even South Korea these days, yeah. And even then, they apparently select the goods such that the goods do not contain information about the external world. Oh yeah, of course. So if they find out, the people think that. Uh, right mean, now, a young child would tell you that they are the richest in the world. Mm -hmm. So they select this input. They only buy generic like, products. Yeah, the ones that do not show them the rest of the world. But for years, South Korea has been reading... Oh, if they've been... You know what they've been? They, they're sending DVDs in balloons. Yeah, and USB and sticks. And over the USB sticks and full of movies and to show them South Korea is much better. <laughs> it's, it's like... It's like <laughs> the Soviet Union. We used to live in Soviet Union, where like, <coughs> the only product you buy is Soviet made. You are not allowed to buy Japanese TV, Japanese cars. If only ones who are in political power, they would buy it, and then they would show it to the rest of them. Anyway, so distance does matter, right? Closer to your neighbor, richer neighbor, more richer, you are richer as well, yeah. Anyway, so coming back to this, so this is a bit moderate correlation, higher than 0 0.5. That's my benchmark, so I have to be consistent in my analysis, but some people might find 0 0.4 and still think it's a moderate correlation. If they have a reason, they should explain why it's moderate. But it's obviously a weak correlation, not in half of what the perfect correlation is, isn't it? So it's weak correlation still. So that's moderate correlation between the two. What do we do? We can either drop it or not. But then we don't want to drop it because theory says family background is not complete without the family, uh, without inclusion of the uh, uh, information about education, attainment of both parents. So we have to find a way to keep them together. One way is apparent is uh, to hypothesize that uh, they have equal effects on schooling. So our beta one equals to beta three. So we should hypothesize that these are equal in terms of economic effects. So one way is to incorporate that information is apparent is to sum them. Mm -hmm. So that information is not lost. Information is not lost. So create an SP parental schooling, or schooling of the parents, which includes this information from mother's education and father's education. And when you estimate it in the model, that will be the hypothesis. So this transformation leads us to this. Because remember, some of the two gives us beta 3. Or just do which two. makes this together then equal. Assume, assumption is that they, these are equal. If we have one beta three there, they must be equal to have just one single beta three. But wouldn't we then need to work on the basis of an average and not something? No. Well that's that won't change because you're just dividing everything by two. The same denominator, you know, isn't it? You can do that. The yeah. Average of yeah makes sense. Theoretically, but then if you divide this by two, you're still keeping the same variation. It's just lower than before. Because you still yeah, have so a like, sum. So like depending on whether we use a sum or an average, like our actual coefficient. No coefficient basically captures the variation, not the magnitude of the value. Yeah. You see, what you are doing here is this I'll come to the moment. Um, if I exit it I may cause a trouble. 
<laughs> so you see, when you take the sum, what you're having is some sort of variation, right? Yeah. Let's say this. Ah, no, no, yeah, I see. By but dividing it by two, it's, it just it, like, it doesn't parallel have, movement downwards, yeah. yeah. You're not actually changing the yeah. cyclical movements. It still increases and decreases would at that, a certain point. that just change the, uh, like, constant? Yes, coefficient estimate will change only. Yeah, because of the value here. Yeah. But that coefficient estimate, uh, the constant is not our our uh, focus okay. yeah, in this case. It, this, it's simply because if we have everything at zero here, beta one just gives us some value that's expected to be schooling of S. Mm -hmm. But then if someone doesn't have a cognitive ability, then you don't usually send them to school. It's usually in specialist schools where they don't, afterwards they don't go to mm -hmm. workforce, so there's no economic uh, effect. So, what we do now is this. We estimate it using SP, transformation. We transform the whole model into this. And as you can see, coefficient estimate for SP, which is the, sum, is the result of SM and SF, is something between the two. That makes sense. It's not to the extreme of father's education, which, is, which has, appears to have a more significant effect or more economically significant effect on the schooling or mothers. Um, I would expect, in reality, this would have ch would carry higher value, if that's the case, if you're looking at the comparison, but I believe it's a uh, different, uh, uh, the, the assumptions of the linear regression are different, as we said earlier, so we just ignore it for now. It's just the value will be something between the 2 and 15. Now, although this is significant, should we keep it or not? That's another question. We have to apparently do a something called restriction test using F test with a hypothesis that betas are equal, beta 3 and beta 4 are equal. So let me move on to that one now. So just doing F test. Right? Yeah. yeah. And another thing is uh, <coughs> these are unchanged. These are unchanged. You have a bit of bias. But which is good. A little bit. So, yeah. So, so the, if the proxy, if this proxy is valid, then you shouldn't expect anything here. What we did is basically we, we, kept, we kept all the variation with simple trans transformation. Yeah? Some transformations completely change the effect of A, S, V, A, B, C. But we're not doing much because we're just taking the sum of the two. So variation is still uh, there. Now, and we talked about that, it's something between them. The question is, what happened to our uh, sum of residuals, squares? Remember, we have removed one variable, so we initially had, let me go back, now it's here. Residual sum squares here. You see, this is when we had both variables included, SM and SF, and this is when we removed one and put SP. Are you with me, guys? This was this case. We have two variables. But it's not now we have one in one because hmm? it's just putting them together. Yes. But because this model is statistical model, it's not like human, you know, it doesn't understand. Oh. It only treats it as if you dropped one variable. <coughs> Which one did you drop? We didn't drop any variable here, we just yeah, yeah, combined together. But then, the, the, here we had three variables, here we have two variables. So the model is mechanical. It treats it as if we dropped some variable. Okay. Or we just... Oh, so you don't have to specify which, which exact variable you got. Sorry, say again? You don't have to specify which variable you uh, got. In what way? I didn't get it. You can't specify which variable you, you got. Simply, uh, you simply like say that this is two different variables. Yeah, okay. And we estimate the model. Usually, sum of squared residuals is lower here than here automatically. In the sense that the more you were at variables, the more accurate it gets, basically. You remember, the R squared increases as there are more variables, yeah? Mm -hmm. So we dropped one of the variables, 
mechanically or we drop both of them and I just added one. You replace the two with the one. So one variable missing here, right? So mechanics tells us that the R squared will be different or the sum of re squared residuals will be different. Go ahead. What happens if you drop one and you do two times P, three times the other? Two times, what do you mean two? Let's go back. Because you're assuming that M and male and female are the same, right? Oh yes, that's the assumption, but we cannot simply drop them. Okay. We have to still incorporate the information, but then make, make sure that they become one variable. Cool. So you can drop one and just do you main can plus drop male, it so it's two times the... Oh, I see your point. No, there is always, you know, if I'm if a male educated for 12 years, female, female may be educated for 13 years, so it's not twice the amount of the other usually. So there's always variation, right? Well, they are educated to... Isn't that the assumption? Though? Assumption here is that we have to keep the... Uh, keep the variation. Oh, because you're just sounding. Okay, yeah, okay. we just sound them rather than doubling one and then assuming that that's enough. Instead of summing, you just double. No, that's coefficient true. estimates may be close to each other. Mm. Yeah, we may have estimates. Let's say a male effect maybe zero point five, female effect zero point forty five. Yeah, mm. uh, close. It's not much significant. Um, guys, one thing I should tell you here is this: a good question. Uh, is that when we hypothesize that coefficients are the same, or in other words, beta 1 equals beta 2, we are not saying identical. They are similar. In other words, they are not statistically different. So beta 1 could be 0 0.5, beta 2 could be 0 0.45. They are different, but statistically not significantly different. We can accept the effect to be economically the same. That's the idea here. Yeah, this, this coefficient equality, Something that I missed. But then I if, failed you, to if you yeah. take them as equal, then you're inducing too big of an error, most of the time. Yeah, we're assuming that they have more or less equal effects because we don't tell them as if they are identical. We don't assume that they are identical effects. It's just they are statistically not different from each other. Their effects are around the true effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah? In that sense, we have to combine them together rather than dropping. And is, is there a test to see that? In the yes, we do now. That's, we, we do, that's where we're going now. It's F-test, if the restriction is yeah. valid. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, notice this. Oh, jumped forward. Notice this, that as long as, as soon as we drop a variable, what do we expect? R squared should go down. In this case, adjusted or adjusted, uh, because we're comparing the two. R, let's say R squared or adjusted. But they should go down, which is happening now. Only very because variation is increasing. Yeah, but it only went down very like minimally. Minimum, which means minimum now. Now the question is: Is this minimal variation significant? We have to test if this is significant, statistically. We can ignore it economically. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is small variation, still thirty-two percent. Or look at this: what 12, 12 point change. So yeah. residual sum of squares is the determinant of R squared yeah. because it's part of the R squared formula. So um, is this statistically different from this? If it is, then we drop this. We don't use the proxy. We stick to the original. In other words, is our approximation or transformation of the variable altering our estimations significantly? Is this clear, guys? Yeah? Okay. That's now the F test. Here it is. Basically, we run two regressions for F test. One we call unrestricted, second one restricted. Unrestricted is this regression, which is the original without the proxy. Restricted is basically the regression with SP instead of the two. Make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. So we are restricting the model to become this two variable model rather than three variable model. And then we take the residual sum squares of this restricted model and residual sum squares of unrestricted model difference over one. One is our 
restrict restriction number. Right now we have one restriction only, which is beta one equals beta two. So this changes. In other words, the uh, uh, if the restrictions are larger or more, let's say we have beta one equal to beta two equal to beta three, then you have at least three restrictions here because we're saying beta one equal to beta two, beta two equal to beta three, and beta one equal to beta three. Three restrictions. But here we only have one restriction, so that's one. And then divided by some of the residuals of unrestricted, n minus k, n being the sample size, minus the k is the number of beta, so one, two, three. And that's the result. Now, going back, let me show you what we got the numbers. Is it one? It's four then? Because beta one is count? Oh no, it's four then two. Notice this. That's squared, sum of squared residues for unrestricted. Mm -hmm. That's for restricted. So that's where we get the numbers from. Yeah. All we need now is plug them in there. In there. So that's 30, 18. That's the result. Oh, wait. So n is appears to be so we counting that beta one as well. My understanding was that yeah. the k will only include the variable. So with the large sample, so yeah, it seems uh, yeah, mm -hmm. this is basically four k's in this case. So they're including beta one. With the large sample, the k doesn't matter because uh, the uh, critical values for f are only available for certain values of uh, observations. So, however. That would not be a huge mistake, although it would be a mistake in the exam. So k is basically the number of estimated coefficients rather than the number of variable and, in this case. Is 500 or 400? Um, one thing I should tell you is, I don't know why this book says it. This is k plus 1, really. It's minus 1. Uh, so n minus 1 plus k uh, plus 1, because this would be in brackets. Uh, these not all degrees of freedom. Hmm? Yes, yeah. this will be the degrees of freedom 1 and degrees of freedom 2. Um, the, one of the books I use usually at, at other institutions is this. Uh, let me rewrite it. So I'm going to stop this here. Uh, 